for those of you who are new, welcome. We're a group of med students and doctors who are here to teach you all your exam content and we're going to look at some passive questions and quizzes as well so we can practice applying that content too. OK, so that's who we are and what we do. So timings for today, five minute introduction at the start, doesn't normally take longer than that. And as I say, if you have been here before, it won't be any different. So don't worry about this. Then we'll have about an hour and 10 minutes of teaching. Now, the break, which I have got scheduled for 11.15, might be a bit earlier than that, OK? It might be about 11, maybe even a little bit before that, just because of the way the content has been split up today. You'll be pleased to know there's actually not a lot of content today. It's quite a chilled session, so we can go a little bit slower. If you want me to, I can slow down at parts um, even more. Um, and we can have a lot of time for questions as well, if anyone has them, not just on today's topic, but in anything in general, to be fair. And then we'll have another hour and 10 minutes of teaching. OK, and then we'll have lunch at 12.30. And again, that time could be back a little bit earlier just so we can finish earlier today, but it should be around 12.30. OK, and then we'll have teaching until about two o'clock and we'll end up their session there. OK, so please do write these times down, especially the break and the lunch, because I've been a moderator. I'll mention a bit more about them in a second, but we get loads of questions about when's break, when's lunch, and that's always really annoying because we want to be answering biology questions. OK, so please do write them down. So I'll give you a few seconds just to write that. <laughs> Perfect. So before we start, a little bit about me and the reason why we do this is just so you know how I'm qualified to be teaching you guys, but also just a bit about me. So I'm not just a stranger teaching you. So my name is Tom. I'm a fourth year medical student at King's College London um, and there's a picture of me in scrubs. Um, surgery on that day it was really fun. It's not something that I enjoy particularly, but it was nice to actually get involved and to see patients. It's always the best part of medicine. Um, I actually want to be a GP at the moment, so very far from surgery, but I like to keep things general. That's the main reason why I want to go into GP because um, it allows me to see a wide range of stuff. And if anyone's got any questions on what life's like as a medical student, then please do ask that as well. I'm happy to answer that at the end of the session. OK, so things like how to get into medicine, the grades you need, they're normally quite common questions. I do other things outside of tutoring and medicine as well. So I volunteer for a charity called Street Doctors, where we go around and teach first aid to at risk young people. That's always really great because especially in London, knife crime is so high. So do check us out and you might have even been taught by us before. And I also do Taekwondo and have done for about 10 years now. So I'm nearly at that belt. Um, I really ought to be at this point, but I'm not quite yet it's just because of uni. Um, but yeah, there's a picture from my last grading, which I thought was quite cool. Um, so yeah, there we go. That's everything about me. Good. So today's session will be teaching from myself. Past paper questions that we'll look through together and then quizzes as well. And now for those of you who have been here before, you'll know how we do this. But for those of you who are new, we use something called Slido. You might have seen this before, you might not. Um, and you basically just join through a code on the screen or a QR code, and that should let you then interact with us. Things like the quizzes, little polls and ratings as well. You can then basically tell me what you're thinking. OK, good. If you've got a question today, please do ask. So we've got a team of moderators who are here both to publish content, um, so little summaries, but also to answer any questions you've got. So please do pop them in the Teams Q&A if you want them answered straight away. Now, the Teams Q&A will be closed at times because there's a lot of you guys normally, so we can't always have it open because the questions can flood in. Um, today, I don't anticipate that happening just because it is a much more chilled session. But just in case it does, if the chat is closed, don't worry, it'll be open again soon. That's the reason why it's closed, so they can answer all the questions that are there already. OK, and now if you wanted to ask me something directly, although I will be looking at the team's Q&A at times, um, the main way to do it is through Slido. So about halfway through the session and at the end of the session, we'll have a Slido Q&A and that's where you can really ask me questions directly because I will see those questions come up on the screen. OK, <clears throat> so that's the best way to talk to me, I would say. Good. So introduction and we're bang on time so that's great so today's session is on relationships in an ecosystem okay and also the human impact on ecosystems so we have covered a little part of this topic before okay in some recent sessions but mostly it is new so don't worry if you recognize some sort of names going on here and there okay so the topics specifically that we're covering are ecosystems food chains interdependence what that means and food webs and also human impact 
projects, okay, and there's two specific processes that we're looking at. So based on those topics, and this is our first slide of interaction of the day, can you tell me how confident you already feel? So as I mentioned, there's the QR code, which you can scan with your phone or whatever you're using, and there's also the uh, number there, which you can join on the website if you're not using a phone. <coughs> and that should make it easier. So I'll give you some time just to answer this one. We can see how confident we're already feeling. <clears throat> Good, so thanks to the nine of you who've already answered. I'm really on the ball there. I think the slider code is in the Teams Q&A as well under the publish column. So you guys should be able to see that um, throughout. So don't worry if you get disconnected at all, the code won't change. Perfect, so we've got 33 of you in already. I'll leave this up just for a little bit longer so that everyone can get logged in, signed up on Sido because we will have some quizzes at our points. And we wouldn't want those of you who haven't logged in yet to have a time disadvantage. So a little bit about the quizzes. They do get very competitive. Um, you know, the leaderboard does get displayed at the end of each question. So do try and answer them correctly because that's how you're going to get to the top. Um, not many people get full marks so you know if you take your time and just answer correctly that's an easy way to get to the top otherwise time does matter so that's how it rates you um, outside of correct answers Good. so that's 62 of you i'm just going to check how many of us there are in the call so there's 80 uh, 134 of us at the moment so i shall wait a little bit longer <clears throat> One last little heads up is that there is a slight delay, I think about 10 to 15 seconds between what I'm saying right now and what you guys are seeing on your screens. So if Slido pops up on your phone, that's probably because I have just said that I'm going to do a Slido interaction and so I've started it, but you're getting a bit of a delay in the actual Teams call. Um, and so do just try and answer your slider question. If you don't know, then just wait for the sort of team's call to catch up on that. Um, I'm sorry about that. That's just a technology thing. I can't really change that. That's just a heads up in case anyone's a bit confused as to why Slido pops up a little bit before I talk about it on the slides. Good, so I think we'll wait until 80 people. Yep, good, that's 80, perfect. So quite a mix actually. I've never seen such a good spread of data, but that's fine. So. Some people feeling really confident, eights, nines, tens. Equally, some people not feeling confident at all. And that's absolutely fine either way, guys. Okay, hopefully most of you will end up on the sevens, eights, nines, and tens end of the scale after this. Perfect. The LOs for today are, we're gonna know what makes an ecosystem, what makes a population, and how to define a species as well. Look at food chains and the components of a food chain, and that includes giving the right terms for the different parts of the food chain. Then we'll click food webs and interdependence, competition and ecosystems, and what affects um, the numbers of prey and predators. We'll look at the relationship between predators and prey. Then we'll get human impact, which includes those two processes, bioaccumulation and eutrophication. Okay. So I'll leave that for a second, just in case you're writing those down. The reason why we give you the learning objectives is so that you can map out exam questions to topics. OK, so your exam questions will likely focus on one of these learning objectives at a time. <clears throat> now, the session today is being recorded, so this will be sent to you afterwards. So if there's any point which I go too fast on um, and we don't have time to catch up at the end, or if there's anything you do miss, then don't worry because you can just go back on the recording to watch that bit again. Similarly, if there is anything you miss, although there will be summaries published in the Teams Q&A, um, you can just use the recording to go back and watch those. Perfect, okay. Enough time, apologies if it's not. So, talking about ecosystems first, okay. I want you to think about what actually is an ecosystem, and I want you to think about any examples that you might know. Okay, so some very common examples in the world. Think of the different environments there are. Okay, and think about what an ecosystem therefore is. Maybe you've seen this topic before, that might make it easier. Okay, so let's get some definitions. So an ecosystem is all of the organisms in a particular area 
alongside the non-living components too. So this refers to the actual habitat or the environment that they're in. Okay, so the physical place. Cool. So two components to that really are communities and habitats. So yeah, again, there's more to define here. So I've kind of spoken about habitats already. These are like the physical places, and that includes everything like the temperature, the humidity, um, the physical space, the light availability. So all of the non-living factors. And then we've got the communities, which is basically all of the different organisms and species that there are in that area. So we've got the non-living stuff, and we've got the living stuff, okay? So ecosystems are the total of both, okay? So it's the organisms and the actual place where they live, okay? Now let's think of some examples. So let's rub this out on the screen. So one of the best examples that I think of is the rainforest ecosystem, okay? Because that's teeming with life, so rainforest ecosystem. So with this example, I want you to have to think about the habitat, first of all, because that's easier. And then we need to think about the communities that there are there. So the habitat, it's quite easy. That's a rainforest. OK, so it's um, high humidity. There's a lot of rainfall, so high humidity and rainfall. Um, it can get quite hot as well. Um, and then what else is there? There's some light availability, and that's near the top. So in the canopy layer and then down by the bottom, that's where it's quite dark so there's quite a variation in the light availability so this is what we talk about when we talk about habit habitats that's basically everything about the um the location and that's the non-living factors like heat temperature and light availability okay now let's talk about communities that are there so what kind of animals do we have or not just animals so we have mostly plants actually so there's a lot of trees uh, we also have fungi fungi um at the sort of floor level so there's a lot of mushrooms and we also have lots of organisms uh lots of animals sorry organisms would include all of that mostly things like insects primates uh, primates um birds as well so there's clearly lots going on here so the ecosystem would be all of this the habitat and the communities habitat would be the actual place and communities would be the animals and organisms that live there okay Hopefully that clears that up because there will be a quiz question on this later. So that's a little tip. Good. So we've defined ecosystems, habitats and communities. Now we'll look at populations. OK, so what do you think populations are? So essentially they're a group of the same species that live in a certain area. OK, over a certain time if you wanted to. So it has to be the same species. So a population always refers to one species. For example, you might say human population. That'll be talking about the human species, okay? And that's generally living in an area. So for example, we could say the population of the UK, we'd be talking about the human population in the United Kingdom, okay? And that will vary over time. But what is a species? That's the next thing we've got to define. So have a think about that, okay? So just to recap before we talk about that, we've defined an ecosystem, okay? which is basically living creatures and the uh, non-living factors, such as the place where they live. We talked about communities, which are groups of species living in one area, basically. Then we talked about habitats, which are the areas creatures live in, um, including the non-living factors. Then we've got populations, which is a group of species living in an area, and it's the number of individuals in that species. And lastly, we're talking about species. Okay, which we haven't yet defined. So have a think about this. Okay, so I want you to, if you know, explain to me why lions and tigers aren't the same species. So why aren't lions and tigers the same species? That's one of the easiest examples for this. So you might have thought, well, it's obvious, you know, they're not the same species because they look so different, they have different genetics. Yes, that's true, but that's not enough to define them as different species, okay? The key thing for species is that they're a group of organisms that can interbreed successfully to produce fertile offspring. So the, there are two key parts to this, really. Firstly, the fact that they can breed together, okay, because that is important. Um, so, for example, humans and snails can't breed together, thankfully, so they wouldn't be the same species. But more than that, 
it's that their offspring that they produce from breeding have to be fertile themselves, so they have to be able to breed. So that's the main reason why lions and tigers aren't fertile, because aren't uh, species, because if you breed lions and tigers together, you end up with ligers. Okay, so they can breed together, that's a tick, but ligers aren't fertile. Okay, so ligers can't breed with other ligers to produce baby ligers, so they are not able to produce fertile offspring, and that's why they're different species. Okay, good. So although it's true to say that most different species have very different um, characteristics, different physical features, different genetics, the key part here is more about their breeding ability. Okay, so let's just rub out all that up here. Good. So here we've got the example of a horse and donkey this time. So they are able to interbreed, but a mule, which is what you get when you breed a horse and donkey, isn't fertile. Okay, and so they don't count as the same species. Okay. Good. I'll leave that for a second just in case anyone's writing notes and then we'll move on. Okay, good. So that is actually it on ecosystems. A uh, very quick topic. So if you can let me know how confident you feel about them. And that includes being able to define what an ecosystem is, being able to define what a habitat is, what a community is, um, what a population is, and what a species is. Okay. Ah, now, I don't think you have to see that, but I think if I go on the Slido interaction in a second, I can see. <clears throat> okay. But yeah, so it'd be ideal if you could give some examples of each as well. So, talking about an ecosystem. For example, talking about the rainforest would be good, um, but think about the habitat and the communities involved there. Perfect. So I can see 36 of you answered. I'll wait till about 80 of you again, I think, and then we shall have a look at the results. In fact, I might see if I can see this on my phone. Okay. No, I can't see on my phone, but never mind. Okay. Good, 57 of you. Keep going, guys. Nearly 80. Just going to try and see if I can see results on the website. Okay, perfect. So six, six of you. Also, just waiting on about 12 more people, I think, if I've done the maths right. Yep. 10 more, and then we'll get moving on. So as you can see, guys, we are taking it a bit slower today, which should be nice. Um, don't need to be scrambling to write notes. Um, not too much to go through today, so that should be a nice class. Okay, so three more people and we'll have a look, see if I can see the results. If not, we will move on anyway. Right. Okay, last three people. Last one person. Or who's going to be that last person? Perfect, there we go. Right, so I just need this a second. Hopefully I can see. Yes, I can. There we go. Hopefully that's still sharing. So yeah, most of you on fives, so that's perfect to see. Some of you on fours um, and very few of you on ones and twos, which is ideal. If you have got any questions on this, guys, please remember to pop it in the Teams Q&A. And if you wanted to cover anything again, then just ask me um, in the Slido Q&A later on. OK, right. Let's go back to the slides then. So we now covered all those definitions and we go on to the sort of grittier part of the first half of today, I think, which is food chains and food webs. So what is a food chain? I think everyone's probably seen one before, certainly in sort of lower down years, I think. Okay, so a food chain is literally showing which organisms eat what in a particular habitat. OK, so it shows the direction of energy travel. Let's just put this up here. Direction of energy travel or energy movement between organisms. Because when one organism eats another, the energy that that organism had gets passed on to the consumer. Okay, so let's look at an example in a second. 
So we've got pretty. Oh, well, we'll see that later. But we've got producer at the start. OK, so number one is producer. OK, and they're essentially plants or algae because they're the things that can make their own food. So they don't need to eat anything else to make to make energy. Essentially, they can trap it from the sunlight. Now, do you know the process that they use to trap that sunlight energy? OK, have a think about that. And we'll see that on the next slide. Good. Actually, they use photosynthesis, OK, which is a classic process that seems to come up every time. Um, so hopefully you've seen this before. OK, so they make their own organic nutrients um, using energy from sunlight. Essentially, this means they make their own glucose. OK. So have a think about what the word equation is for photosynthesis. Hopefully you've seen it before. And then if you've got that, think about what the chemical equation is, because that's a lot harder. OK. So there's the word equation and the chemical equation below that. So carbon dioxide plus water reacts from glucose plus oxygen. So this is the word equation. So at the start of our food chain, we've got producers. These are things that are generally plants or algae because they're the things that are capable of making their own energy from sunlight. Um, or rather converting that sunlight energy into glucose. OK, free photosynthesis. And this was the chemical equation. Important difference, just in case your exam questions ask you for one or the other, you need to make sure you give it correctly. If it's the word equation, please don't just shorten carbon dioxide to CO2, as tempting as it is, because that wouldn't technically be correct. OK, chemical equation does look a bit scary, but don't worry. <clears throat> if you've not heard my way of remembering it before, I always call that the rule of sixes. So it's six CO2, six H2O, six O2, and then glucose as a molecule has a lot of sixes. So it's C6, H12, which is two times six, O6. Okay, so basically everything there has a six in it. And remember that glucose is the biggest molecule, so that doesn't need that six at the start. Okay, should be an easier way of remembering it. Good. So to clarify, all of that then. So we've got the food chain, which shows the organisms that eat other organisms habitat. We know that produced at the start of this because they can make their own glucose from sunlight through photosynthesis. OK. Next up, if something's not a producer, then it's a consumer. OK, so look at the bottom of the screen. We've got quite a few examples there. A lot of things like birds, worms, even foxes, horses, donkeys, bacteria. OK, that's kind of different and we'll talk about that later. OK, so have a think about that. So we've got the producer at the start. So number one is always the producer. And I can't think of any examples which don't start with a producer. OK. And then we end up with consumers. Because they consume other organisms. OK. So for a definition, a consumer is an animal um, or a plant, actually, because there could be plants. Um, such as the Venus flytrap that eats other animals or plants. OK. Good. I'll leave that for a second just so you can write a note on that. <clears throat> Good. And at this point, I want you to start thinking about any examples of food chains that you might know. OK, because sometimes you might be asked just to write out a sample food chain. OK. And easiest place to start is right at the beginning, so you know that it has to be produced at the start. So just choose any plant or algae even, although algae is probably a little bit harder to think about. So think about plants first. Okay, and then you just add on consumers, basically what eats the thing before. OK. Just to clarify consumers even further, we have some more labels. OK, so you've got primary consumers, secondary consumers, tertiary consumers and so on. OK, so it doesn't necessarily end there, but we rarely see food chains with a quaternary consumer because that would be next. But because of energy losses between transfers, which we'll talk about in a second, they generally don't go past the tertiary consumer. OK. So primary consumer, primary just means the first. So the primary consumer is the one that eats the producer. OK, so the first thing in the chain after the producer is the primary consumer. 
Next, we've got secondary consumer. Can you guess what that means based on the primary consumer definition? So this is the second, and therefore this is the organism that eats the primary consumer. Okay. So we're already beginning to see a food chain appearing on the bottom here. So we had some miscellaneous plants here that were the producer. We've got a worm that's the primary consumer because it eats those leaves on those plants. Then we've got a secondary consumer, which appears to be some kind of bird, which is eating that worm. And then you probably guessed it already, tertiary consumer, third in the chain um, after the producer, of course. Um, and this is the organism that eats the secondary consumer, such as a fox. OK, so the fox would eat the bird. So this down here is a visual representation of a food chain, but this doesn't show us how we would actually draw out a food chain okay, in biology. So if we were to draw this out as a food chain, we would do um, plant. Ideally, we'd be more specific than that, but I don't know what that is, um, so I don't know. Um, and the arrow goes towards the worm because think of it like the plant is entering the worm's mouth. Remember, these arrows show energy transfer. So the energy is transferring from the plant to the worm because the worm is eating that plant. And then the energy will go from the worm to the bird. And then lastly, the bird to the fox. Okay. Now, if a human came along and ate the fox, which would be a bit unorthodox, but if that happened, then we would call that human the quaternary consumer. Okay. So that's when we would use that. But as I said, that's quite rare, basically because all of the energy that gets transferred does get a little bit lost at each stage. So, for example, the energy the plant creates from photosynthesis or the energy that it traps, rather, some of that will be wasted by the plant's growth um, and by heat production. So not all of that energy the plant actually traps will move on to the worm. So some of that energy will go. And likewise with the worm, we've also got some movement here. So we've got growth of the worm, um, heat and movement as well. So they all affect the energy transfers available. OK, so less energy will get to the bird and so on. And that's why we end up with tertiary consumers being the final stage generally. OK. So let's just get rid of that. Perfect. So hopefully that is enough time. On that. Good. Yet again, some more definitions. Today's a very definition heavy session. Um, first, you've got herbivores. You've probably heard that before. Okay. Have a think about what some examples of that might be. So herbivores essentially are plant eaters only. OK, so they only eat plants. Okay. And that's kind of easy to remember, I think, because herb, herbs, they are plants. OK, so herbivores eat only plants. Good. Next, carnivores. Again, should be quite easy. You've probably heard this before. Carni is meat in Latin, or it comes from that word. So carnivores are meat eaters. Okay. So anyone who's done Spanish, for example, would know that carne is meat in Spanish. So that hopefully helps with that. You can also get omnivores, which are a mix of the two. So humans mostly are omnivores, which means they can eat both plants and animals. Okay. So here we've got some definitions. So organisms that eat plants, organisms that eat animals. Omnivore wasn't actually included on this slide, but I'm going to put it in there just so you're aware. So omni comes from the Greek, I think, for all. So omnivores eat everything, basically, plants and animals. And I've got this last one over here, which is slightly different. OK, so these are decomposers. So notice this doesn't end in vor. This is just a different word entirely. And basically, they decompose dead organisms. So this will be things like bacteria. OK, so remember we saw on that slide before the bacteria does count as a consumer and that's because it's a decomposer. OK, so bacteria will come along, find a dead body. OK, so maybe a bird has died. OK, and it's fallen to the ground. And um, it's sort of decaying on the floor. Bacteria will come up and it will start to digest this bird. OK. Good, and we'll look more into that in a second. Right, so first quiz question of the day. Okay, so please do make sure you join that. We'll see all your nicknames come up on here. Perfect. I'll give you some time just to log in on that. Seeing some similar names already, so nice to see you guys again.
Great, that's 14 of you. I think we'll wait until about 70 of you have joined and hopefully more will join after that. Don't worry if you can't quite join yet, guys, because you can always join um, at any point. Perfect, lots of you here today. Hi, anyone who came to the revision session last weekend as well. There wasn't too many of us there, so that was quite a chilled class as well. Perfect, lots of you, right. So remember, this does count towards the leaderboard. OK, so everyone ready. Which word describes the plants in a food web? Producers, predators, herbivores or carnivores? Awesome, very quick answers already there. I'd like to see that. And some of you might find this topic really easy. Everything we've talked about so far might be really obvious to you, but that's great. OK, <clears throat> it's always good just to clarify. And I would just um, remind you all that for your exams, questions that ask about definitions, especially in ecology, so talking about ecosystems, for example, species, um, herbivores, they all require very specific definitions. So it's not enough just to kind of understand what it is, but you do need to have like a set definition in your head, okay? Using all the keywords. For example, with species, it's not enough just to say, um, that they look really different or that they're different um, genetically, you'd have to talk about how they have, um, they don't have the ability to breed to produce fertile offspring. Okay, two different species. Good, right, so that's 95 of you have answered already, so that's perfect. Well done, guys. Yeah, so 94% are right, so it's producers. Remember, producers, start of the food chain, slash food web, they produce, hence the name, their own glucose through sunlight, okay, by that process of photosynthesis. Herbivores, I can see why people put that, but these are consumers that eat plants, so certainly wouldn't be plants generally. Um, carnivores eat meat, so they have no relevance to this at all, really. Um, I guess a Venus flytrap would count as both a producer and a carnivore, for example, but that's a very unique example. And then predators, we haven't talked about these yet, but these are essentially the top animal in the food chain that they're in, okay? Or the top consumer. Good, right. So, Zachary made a great start there in four seconds at the top of the chain, and then, um, well, and everyone else, you got that right. Perfect. So, we talked a little bit about decomposers already, okay? But these are organisms that feed on dead and decaying organisms. OK, so as I mentioned, if something dies, then bacteria will likely get onto it and start to decay it. And that's why um, dead bodies break down and don't start to look um, how they look like when they're alive. OK, so when you see um, on film dead bodies that have been dead for a while, it's because of the bacteria they get onto the body. That's why they look so sort of horrendous and decayed. OK. And that's how they end up being skeletons by the end, because all of their living material is decomposed by these bacteria okay, and fungi. Okay, Good. As well as these sort of dead and decaying organisms, they also feed on the undigested parts of plant and animal matter, and that's in their feces. Okay, So any waste that comes out of their body in the form of feces, that can have some undigested parts. I think especially with some rabbits, for example, I think sometimes their droppings can actually have quite a lot of undigested material. Um, and then that will be fed on by these decomposers, okay, and that will provide a good source of energy for them as well. So the two key examples there, which we've already talked about, bacteria and fungi, okay. So the way they do it is by secreting enzymes. So we've talked about enzymes before, but if this is your first session with us, enzymes essentially speed up biological processes. So these are processes that would happen naturally um, or reactions that would happen naturally and then enzymes just happen to speed that up, okay? And then once the um, decaying matter they're trying to break down is small enough, they can then absorb it, okay? Because remember, bacteria and fungi are very small themselves, okay? So they can't just go up to this like dying bird and eat it all. That just wouldn't happen. They have to secrete those enzymes externally um, think of it as like how we sweat, okay? Think of it as for bacteria, that's almost like the enzymes they secrete. They come out of the body and they sort of go onto that organism and those enzymes will break it down so they can absorb the smaller molecules that are result that are produced as a result, okay? 
There is a separate term for creatures that eat decomposing material um, without having to digest it externally, and that's detritivores. Hopefully I've spelled that right. Um, but they essentially digest um, or decompose dead matter internally. Okay, that's the key difference there. So unlike these decomposers, which have to secrete enzymes externally onto the material, detritivores um, can eat the sort of dead matter directly, and they therefore use enzymes inside their body to digest that matter. Good. So I'll leave that up for one more second so you can write that down. Another quiz question now. Hopefully everyone's ready. Give you a second just to get your phone back up. So krill are small animals that eat tiny plants. Which word describes krill in the food web slash chain? Are they producers, predators, herbivores or carnivores? So same options as before. So firstly, think about are they a producer or are they a consumer? If you think they're a consumer, which type are they? Are they herbivores, carnivores, predators? Which is the best word to describe them out of those four options? We'll wait until about 90 of you have answered, I think, and then we'll move on. Lots of quick answers already. Love that, guys. Thank you. Perfect. 77, 80. Nice. 10 more of you. No more. Good. Nearly there, guys. Yep, so with these questions, just read them carefully, okay? Because it's very easy to just mix up a few of the answers because they sound quite similar. Good. There we go. There's 90. Okay. So, yeah, most of you got that right. Well done. So, herbivores, the reason why they eat plants, okay? They themselves are consumers rather than producers because they don't. So that produce their own glucose, okay? They're not able to undergo photosynthesis, so it's not that. They eat tiny plants, therefore they're the primary consumer in that chain. That wasn't an option here, so the best word to describe them is a herbivore because they eat plants, okay? Krill aren't carnivores because they don't eat other animals, so they don't eat meat. And they're certainly not predators because they're not at the top of the food chain. So I think they actually mentioned it in Finding Nemo, if you've seen that. So krill are eaten by whales, Okay, and probably other fish as well. So they're certainly not predators. So predators are the top of the food chain, remember. Perfect. Okay. Well done, Zachary, keeping your lead. And that's a great time as well. Another four second answer. Well done, everyone else has got two out of two. Good. So we're now looking at example food chain. Okay. So we've got our flower to start with, which is the producer. So remember that this is the producer because it undergoes photosynthesis. And therefore can create its own glucose from sunlight okay next up in our example we've got a snail okay so a snail will then eat the flower notice how the arrow is in the direction of the snail because that's where the energy is transferring okay so that's the primary consumer and we could also describe the snail as a herbivore okay good frog which is the secondary consumer because it eats the primary consumer so this eats the snail, and again, that energy is transferring from the snail to the frog. Now we could call this frog a carnivore. Um, I don't believe they eat plants, so it wouldn't be an omnivore. Good example for each, therefore, a herbivore, you could say a snail, carnivore, a spider, a frog, for example, um, anything like that. Um, and then omnivore, I'd say humans is the easiest example to think of for that. Okay. Lastly, in this chain, a fox might eat a frog. Um, and that would therefore be the tertiary consumer. Now we have talked about another word that would describe the fox. So the fox is the predator of this food chain, okay? And that's because it's the top of the food chain. So nothing eats the fox, okay? In this food chain at least anyway. Good, so hopefully using all those definitions, that makes sense. Okay, I'm just gonna rub those out just so you can see the slides. And it's best to write this example down, I think, just so you've got a definite example of a food chain that you could just reel out in an exam. Okay, so I would have one learnt 
just so you could use one easily. Perfect. Right. Got an example question now. So the drawing below shows a food chain, including a rove beetle. So turnips eaten by maggots, which are eaten by rove beetles. OK, so have a look at that because we've got a quiz question coming up. and I don't believe this picture is on that quiz question, but I can flick backwards. So. Which word describes the rove beetle? Is it a producer, a predator, a herbivore or a decomposer? And now I'll just flick backwards so you can see that picture again. So which word describes the rove beetle? OK, have a think about that. Even without the options, have a think about what words you would use to describe the rove beetle. There's at least three words that you could use to describe it. Okay, and now I'll go back to the quiz question. So we've got 14 answers already, which is great. Hopefully more of you can answer now that we're back on it. Good 60 answer already, it's perfect. If you've got the right answer, as I said, there's at least two more answers that you could give that aren't on that list. Have a think about what you might say. <clears throat> Have lots of answers coming in. We'll wait for 90 again, I think. And then we'll move on. Great, so I think that's everyone. I might leave it a few more seconds actually because there are still some answers coming quickly. <laughs> Good, so if you do know the answer actually as well, think about how you would describe those other two organisms in that food chain. So what words you could use for them. I think we'll wait one more minute and then we'll move on. Good. So the rove beetle in this food chain is a predator. So well done. 80 percent of you got that right. Ah, So I can imagine why a lot of you put decomposers. So let's break this down then. The reason why it's a predator, first and foremost, is because it's top of that food chain. OK, so predator is right because it's top of that food chain. OK, and it's a consumer. It's certainly not a producer because it doesn't produce its own glucose. It doesn't undergo photosynthesis as far as I know. Um, producer in that case would be the turnip okay <laughs> i think that was there now is it herbivore no because it eats maggots and maggots are an animal okay so it's certainly not a herbivore either is it a decomposer no because remember decomposers feed on dead or decaying matter okay and maggots um even though they could do that maggots are not dead or decaying matter maggots are consumers just like any other okay so the answer here was a predator. And now the answer to the other questions I asked. So you could also describe rove beetle as a secondary consumer. OK, because in this food chain, the turnip was the producer. Therefore, the maggots were primary consumers. So the rove beetle is a secondary consumer. And also you could call it a carnival because it was eating um, another animal. It was eating maggots. OK. Now for the others, producer, that was the turnip. Herbivore, that was the maggots. Um, and then decomposers, you could also call the maggot a decomposer, not in this food chain, but maggots in general do feed on dead and decaying matter. I would actually call that a detritivore because I think they actually eat the decaying material and digest it internally rather than secreting enzymes like bacteria do to digest that material externally. OK, so just to recap, detritivores digest it internally, so it eats that material, decomposers digest it, externally so break it down by secreting enzymes okay good so world well one's at the top and one everyone else has got three out of three perfect good times coming in here as well good next exam question so have a look at this food chain slightly longer this time there's four organisms here so aphids are insects that feed on potato leaves if you can see that Aphids and potato plants are part of the food chain shown below. So you've got plate, uh, potato leaves, aphids, ladybirds and swifts. Okay, which type of bird? 
So what could farm farmers use to get rid of aphids? And now this isn't a quiz question, this is a poll, and that's because there's more than one right answer here. Okay, so that's a clue. Don't just tick one, there's a few. So what could farmers use to get rid of aphids? Okay, and I'll just flip back onto the picture again, so you can see it. Perfect, so hopefully that's enough time. So have a look at that now. This is more than one right answer. And we'll see what everyone's come up with in a second. It's a 48 of you have answered. I'll wait until about 95, I reckon. And there are some answers here that would likely increase the number of aphids. So I want you to have a think about what they might be. And why. Give that 85 to wait for 10 more and then we'll move on. Apologies to anyone who is having a slow connection and therefore can't get their answers in. Um, that's just the way we do things. I'm trying to slow it down today just because we have got the time. But it's not great for everyone else who has to wait, essentially. Okay, 92 of you, three more. One more person. Who's going to be that last one? There we go. Perfect. Oh, no. Uh, let's go back. So this has actually shown the right answers annoyingly. Let's see what everyone's put. So we've got. Oh, so, yeah, most people are going for the right answers there. So we're two right answers. OK, so we've got. Uh, ladybirds, 73 percent. OK, and 80 percent went for the insecticide as well. So insecticide quite obviously would kill the aphids directly okay? because aphids count as insects. And then the ladybirds would kill them because they're the next animal up in the food chain. OK, so if we just have a look at this food chain okay, here. You can see that if you increase the number of ladybirds, you would then have more predators that could eat the aphids. OK. Good. OK, now the reason why the others are wrong. Fertilizer certainly wouldn't help. That would actually be an example of one that would probably increase the number of aphids, just because if you use a fertilizer, then you're going to produce more potato leaves. And that means that there's more food for the aphids to eat. So their populations might increase. OK, and this is talking about interdependence, which is a concept we'll look at after the break. OK. And the other one, slug pellets, that wouldn't do anything. OK, because that's not likely to affect aphids. And then weed killer. Um, Unless that actually killed the potato leaves, uh, potato, yeah, which you wouldn't really want because the whole point is that you want more potato, um, then that wouldn't likely affect the aphid population either. OK, so that's why the only two answers that were right there were um, ladybirds and insecticide. OK, so I've got a little summary table. So this is a great table to write down. So I'll give you some time to do that. So remember, 